Welcome to Brain Bites, the bite-sized neuroscience podcast of the Ascend program, advancing STEM community engagement through neuroscience discovery. We're your hosts. I'm Dan Nemeth. And I'm Dr. Lorena Areal. Brain Bites is a show designed to guide people of all ages through the mysterious, complex, and exciting world of neuroscience in short, digestible episodes. Okay, we're here with Dr. Stephen Macknick. And Dr. Macknick, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I'm a professor at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University. Um, I'm a neuroscientist. And I'm interested in all aspects of uh, perception and cognition, but sp- mostly in the visual system. Okay, great. I mean, uh, that's a good starting point is, is kind of understanding the visual system as a whole. In our previous podcast, we had one podcast about the senses, um, and we briefly covered the visual system as you know, we covered rods and cones in your retina and how that projects through the optic nerve and then to the, your, um, we kind of jumped through the, the thalamus, but we, you know, end in the occipital lobe in the visual cortex. And so would you kind of give us a little bit of more detailed analysis of, of the neuroanatomy of the visual cortex or visual system? Sure. So, so light enters your eye by way of a lens. So light is just, basically you can think of the entire world as a bunch of mirrors. Everything you can see is a mirror, and it's either a good mirror or a bad mirror. I would call a bad mirror something that looks black because it absorbs the light and it doesn't reflect it very well. Okay. And, uh, you know, an actual mirror that you like having in your bathroom is a very high-quality mirror. It reflects everything, and it doesn't scatter any of the light. And everything else is in between. So white paint may reflect a lot of the light because it looks white, but it might scatter that light. So there's no real reflections. It's just all the light bounces off to your eye. So basically the entire world is a bunch of surfaces that have mirror-like qualities, and light comes from the light sources to bounce off those. Your eye then uh, intercepts those photons and focuses them onto the back of your eye where there's a light-sensitive sheet of neurons called photoreceptors, and those neurons uh, detect the light and transmute that light source, that light, transduce that light into electrochemical signals that then travel through the circuits of your eye, through your optic nerve, into the thalamus. Uh, a specific part of the thalamus where the optic nerve connects is called the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, what we, it's a mouthful, so we call it the LGN. <laughs> and uh, from there... It travels through a series of wires, essentially, called axons and neurons that go back. It's the very back point of your brain, right above your spine, called the visual cortex or the primary visual cortex. And if I had to feel that on my head, where, where would that be? If you put your finger on the very back of your head, you can feel a little knob right above your neck. Okay. That, right under that is where the primary visual cortex is. So it's right on the top, right beneath the skull. It's right beneath the skull is where the central visual part is, but it's laid out in a map that matches the retina, and that map is actually deformed in all of the undulations and what we call gyri and sulci of the brain on the surface, and actually most of the primary visual cortex in a human is on the midline of the brain. So you know how the brain looks like it's like two uh, jello molds put together, Mm -hmm. um, left and right. If you go into the very back of it and you walk in through the big crack in the middle, to the left and the right is most of the primary visual cortex. So there's some on the very back surface, and that's where the very central part of vision is, and that's kind of the most important part of vision. And then going out... Uh, from there, those, the primary visual cortex connects to the to what we call that we also call primary visual cortex V1. It connects to V2 and V3 and V4, and there's kind of a hierarchy that becomes a series of visual areas of the brain that do seem to have different kinds of functions for different kinds of visual stimuli. And so those different regions are connected together, and they kind of act as a as a computer to compute what you are what your photoreceptors are receiving exactly. and then will ultimately send those process or those signals to your visual cortex to say you are looking at a hat or yeah. you're looking at a table. Exactly. So if you think about what visual systems doing, your retina is made up of these photoreceptors, which you can think of as pixels in a camera. And if you just had one photoreceptor right in your eye, it would just have more or less signal depending on whether it was looking at a place with a lot of light or a little bit of light. Well, that's also true when you have a lot of photoreceptors. There's just in, in a given part of the image, just to, to the, 
from the point of view of the photoreceptor, there's either just a lot of light or a little light. It doesn't see an object. It just sees a one tiny bit of the visual world. And then all of the different uh, photoreceptors next to each other get different parts of the image. And the brain then takes all of that, uh, all of those inputs, a lot of light or a little light, and puts together an image from that. It actually computes what must be outside based on that pattern of inputs. That's very cool. And so, forgive me, I'm not a visual scientist, a neuroscientist. I do synapse formation. Um, so you have these different regions of the, the visual cortex, and it's it's getting mapped out according to what's in the retina. And then in these different regions, are these cells doing different things? Like some are sensing motion and some are sensing, you know, brightness. I, I, I don't Yes, know. exactly. Okay. So you'll have neurons that see edges that are vertical. So if you hold up your arm with your elbow on the bottom and your fingers pointing straight up, that was what we call a vertical orientation. Now, if you make it horizontal, we call that a horizontal orientation. And then if you make it oblique, sideways, there's neurons that like horizontal, there's neurons that like vertical, and there's neurons that like oblique of every single possible orientation. And so those neurons will actually help you see, for example, the surface of a table and where the edges are. And your brain can now use that information to say, oh, this is one given surface and it's one given object. And you have other neurons that see the different three-dimensional aspects, with it farther or nearer. There's neurons that help you see whether something's moving or not moving and which direction it's moving. There's neurons that are specific to faces, which are really important to humans. Mm -hmm. There's neurons that are really specific to hands, which are really important to humans. And there's neurons that are specific to certain kinds of expertise you may gain through life as well. And so... Our job as visual scientists is to figure out how we get from those points of light in the retina to everything else and how it is that we can actually see anything in terms of its object and understand its meaning and and have that help us survive. It's really amazing because, you know, we always think, oh, you see with your eyes, but you really you see with your brain more than your eyes. Your eyes are just kind of collecting the, the data and your brain is really what's Absolutely. And you can everything. convince yourself of that right now. Just close your eyes <laughs> and imagine... Your parents, one of your parents' face or your guardian, if you don't have parents, you just sit there and you imagine their face, right? That is what's happening is we know, we know when you imagine things like that, you're activating the visual system of your brain and you're actually seeing um, in those neurons in a very similar way to actually seeing their face. Those neurons are lighting up in a very similar way. And so that is exactly what's happening. You've just had vision without your eyes open. That's really cool. Yeah, that's kind of reminds me of. I guess that's like you know normal daydreaming and, and dreaming in general. Pop, it, does that activate the same systems then? Yes, exactly. That's true. And and we also uh, don't know as much about non-visual systems, but presumably it's very similar. That you basically have um, a you know olfactory and audition and all these different systems can actually uh, and somatosensory. Those you that's the touch feelings of your skin. You actually have a way of reading that information in from all those different kinds of receptors, whether they're physical or sound or, or smell or chemical, and actually you're building a picture of the world that's this three-dimensional rich world that has space, and that's a function of your brain that, that does that. And that's why you can basically imagine all of those things because the mechanisms to actually experience those things, even when they're real, are in your brain anyway. Definitely gives you a different sense or a different outlook on life, kind of. You kind of have this, you know, if you think of everything as a mirror and everything's reflecting light and you, you're experiencing something, but someone's perception could be different. Even though they have the same photons coming into their into their brain, they might not just be focused on the one thing that is in front or either in their visual space, right? So I think at, at your talk earlier this morning, you were mentioning that we only see very, very limited amount of our world around us. Um, I think it's, it's kind of an interesting concept of not – we're experiencing as much as we can, but we don't take everything in, and it can alter how your, you know, your perception of the world. Yeah, exactly. So um, just let me expand on that for your, for your audience. Mm -hmm. if, if your audience holds out their thumb at arm's length in front of them with their elbows straight and they look at their thumbnail – the thumbnail itself, while you're looking at it, is the only thing you can see with 20-20 vision. It's the only thing you've ever seen. That's That size of visual field 
is the only thing you've ever seen with 20-20 vision. So your glasses, all they do is help you see something that size. And your eye movements move your eyes around and your head movements help your eyes move around to, to then see little bits of the visual scene in high quality. And your brain builds a visual model of the world based on that. Your auditory system is doing something very similar. And so is your, the systems of the feelings on your skin, for example. And these things work together to build a model of what's outside. And so what that means is that you've never really experienced what's outside very well. You've, it's, you've only actually ever truly accurately sampled very little of what's in the world around you. And everything else is you building a model of that in your mind. And so it's not that the world outside doesn't exist. It does. But you've never lived there. You've only ever lived inside your own brain, experiencing the things that your brain's systems feed to you. And so what that means is that most of what you're seeing is technically inaccurate. And so when we experience illusions and we experience magic, that's actually more like the norm of what we're experiencing. It's just the examples that we, we can know for sure cognitively that it's inaccurate to the world. Whereas most of the time, everything we see is inaccurate and we just don't know, right? So that's the difference and that's what magicians are doing for us. That, that's definitely mind-blowing <laughs> and it kind of makes yeah. you... It's, 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 I will say, yeah, the first time I thought about that, actually, even as a neuroscientist, it was this moment of kind of crisis, like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what am I experiencing? <laughs> yeah. But, you know... This is a good segue, though, into uh, kind of illusions. And you mentioned illusions are a way we can look at something and know it's inaccurate, right? right? And um, you have two books, and we have them here. One's Champions of Illusion, another Slight of Mind, and they kind of talk about how magic and illusions, um, how they trick the brain, right? Um, and I would kind of like, you know, do you know of any illusions right away, like off the top of your mind, that our viewers could, our listeners can do right at home? Like with- Sure. Okay, so I told you that I had to, to do something at arm's length with your thumb. Now put out your other thumb, too, We're and put your thumbs well up. Within. Now, now touch your thumbs together horizontally, okay? okay, and put your two index fingers up. So this is like making you know, the football sign when you're playing paper football mm-hmm. right on the tabletop. So, so you, you, you've got a field goal here. So now, again, your elbows are straight. Now if you close your left eye and look at your left fingertip with your right eye open, Oh, my finger vanishes. Your right finger vanishes into the blind spot of your right eye, right? If I switch eyes? Well, let's just stick with that. (laughs) Okay, so (laughs) before we dig too deep on that, you can, if you're looking at your left fingertip with your right eye, your left eye's closed, your right fingertip will disappear, and yet you can see what's behind that fingertip, right? Yeah. Yeah. So do you have x-ray vision danny in your in your blind spot of your right eye feels like it right now you know (laughs) you don't i can assure you even though it feels like you can see what's behind that finger you can't right that's an illusion and the fact of the matter is if you don't put your fingers up you just close one eye you've got a big blind spot in the center very close to the center of your vision that you've always had and you many of your listeners have never known about right and that they've been filling that in with illusory information their entire life and they're just now discovering that they've got a huge huge gap right near the center of their vision where they've never seen they've certainly never seen stereo information they're blind in one eye in that position and that that even if you close one eye it doesn't fill with black like you would think it would because there's no visual information there there are no photoreceptors there that's where the optic nerve connects to your retina, and there's simply no way for you to see there. Instead, your brain, uh, as if to help you, fills that in. And that's really what illusions are almost certainly about. The, I'm telling you, most, I'm asserting most of the world you've ever experienced is an illusion. It's inaccurate. The physical reality is dissociated from your perception of that reality because your brain is basically cutting corners to make things easier for you and in some ways helping you in order for you to actually survive better through these illusory processes. Yeah, imagine if, you know, you had all of this extra sensory, you know, information coming in and you didn't have a way of focusing in on just the important information, your system gets overloaded, you know. Right. How would and we you... call that attention. So when you have all this information coming in through your visual system, you can't process all of it all at once. One way we do that is we have phobias, right? These these high quality pieces of vision 
the size of your thumbnail though I mentioned before, which is the only place you can see high quality information. But even then you have other types of information coming in that you have to filter out mm -hmm. while you pay attention to one thing or the other. And you can think of that as a cognitive level of foveation. So it's a second level of how you focus in on certain information while ignoring others, right? And humans have a very interesting aspect to their attention, I think, which in a way is very puzzling, which is that if I look you in the face, right? I'm looking across the table at you right now, mm -hmm. but I can pay attention to Danny. So Danny, raise your finger without me looking at it. I see it, okay? I'm paying attention to him. I'm not paying attention to you. I'm paying attention to him even though I'm looking at you, mm -hmm. right? So why would I ever want to do that? Because if I pay attention over there, it actually takes about as much time for me to move my attentional spotlight from your face to his hand over there, okay, as it would for me to just move my eyes. So why wouldn't I, why would I ever want the mechanisms, the, the cost of having a mechanism that allowed me to pay attention there while I'm looking at you, right? Because that's visual garbage, right? I can barely see over here. I can see very large motions. I can see that he raised his finger over there, but I can't really tell. I couldn't tell which finger it was, right? right. So it doesn't really help me very much. All that peripheral vision is helping us do really is decide what we're going to look at next for our next major eye movement to foveate with our high quality vision. Mm -hmm. So why would we ever want to be able to pay attention somewhere that's not our fovea? And the answer is partially that you need to pick your next target to where to move your eye. That's presumably how attention developed in, uh, in and that, that why it's so good in primates who are the only mammals that have foveas in their vision. But another reason might be that we use our vision to communicate with each other as humans, mm -hmm. right? We use it to basically tell other people what we're looking at. They can actually tell by looking at each other what they're paying attention to. So we use that to communicate that we're paying attention to them or we're paying attention to someone else or, for example, we're not paying attention to them. If, if your parent comes to you and they're very mad at you, right, you may not want to look them in the eye and that that conveys a certain level of submissiveness that actually can bring down the tension mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. a conversation because humans use their eyes as a social cue, right? So this kind of information is very important, how we use our eyes to communicate what we're paying attention to and what we're not paying attention to, right? And so that is a uh, very important aspect to attention is that we use it to actually deceive each other in a way in order to pay attention to something that we don't look like we're looking at. It's uh, interesting to think about such a complicated process evolving to be polite to each other. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Think about, think about the word polite. What is being polite? Okay, I'm, Being polite is a good thing, right? I'm, I'm asserting that we want to be polite to mm -hmm. each other. But politeness is by definition deception. Okay, it is a form of deception. It means you're behaving in a way you wouldn't otherwise behave, but you're doing it for <laughs> political reasons, right? Mm -hmm. To be polite, you're basically being nice to someone when you don't actually believe it's deserved or that it's not necessarily something you might other do otherwise if you were in a position where you didn't have to be polite at that period of time. That doesn't mean being polite is a bad thing just because it's deception. What it means is that deception is part and parcel to how humans behave with each other. It's an important part. Privacy is an important part of our lives. Mm -hmm. Deception is an important part of our lives, and we have to recognize that in order to understand it in terms of neuroscience, certainly, but also in terms of what's appropriate behavior and what isn't. Mm -hmm. Deception is, in fact, an important and critical part of our behavior in the context of being polite, for example. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. It's not always bad to deceive okay. each other. And, and just to be it's clear, I'm, I'm not just being polite and looking at you. I am very interested <laughs> in the conversation. <laughs> um, so one of the, we talked about the different brain regions, and I've, in reading uh, through one of your, your articles, you mentioned the, um, the bending spoon, and you talk about, you know, kind of waggling it in the air it makes it look like it's floppy that's right and i really really thought the explanation um because i actually didn't know this of, of why we see a spoon that is a solid object looking really flexible why that happens and that it is a, a byproduct of our our anatomy um could you talk a little about that well i to do that i have to i have to give away a magic secret <laughs> <laughs> so we have to warn your listeners that we're about to do some spoilers here spoilers <laughs> so we have a spoiler alert. If you don't want to know how this magic trick works in your brain, then you should stop listening for uh, 
say 30 seconds and then turn back on. <laughs> okay, so um, the, the, the way this uh, illusion works has to do with the way your visual system works and how it sees motion, right? So what you're doing when you see this motion is you're seeing a latency in your visual system of how the, the parts of the, of, the, of the spoon are actually uh, working. And uh, so, so when you're holding the spoon and you're moving it in a certain way, it makes it unclear exactly what parts of the spoon are moving with respect to, to one of another. Now, there's different kinds of spoon bending. I'm not exactly sure what specific kind. Yeah, I was more thinking it. the kind where, you know, you just hold it at the end and kind of wiggle it up and down. Um, you know, it like, a, like a, a kid, noodle, as you, yeah, yeah, a kid could do it with a, a pen or a ruler or something, you know, when you're just moving it quickly. Yeah. And so what the way that has to do with how our visual system see motions and how it sees latent, uh, if you think about it, when something, when you see motion in your visual system, it means that one photoreceptor is active and then another photoreceptor is reactive. And so for us to see the velocity of that, we have to have a neuron in our brain that can compare the change of brightness in one versus the other in a certain period of time. And so our visual system actually takes into account the motion of this spoon, uh, depending on the, the different um, you know, positions of the spoon, and actually sees it as different velocities. And so if you move it at the right rate and then the right... Uh, um, um, kind of way, your visual system sees the ends of the spoon moving more slowly than the center of the spoon, and it looks like it's a floppy, it looks like it's a floppy noodle when it's not. <laughs> and so is that um, a case of, so the cells that maybe see more horizontal versus the cells that see more a diagonal, they're kind of processing at different rates? Is it something like that? No, it's more about, um, well, first off, no one actually knows for sure. Like, no one's done the neuroscience to actually determine how that spoon bending experiment works. But what it almost certainly has to do with how we see the speed of motion uh, in the periphery versus the central part of our vision. So you're foveating one part of the spoon, almost certainly where they're holding it with their fovea. And they're also, and you're following that with your eyes. Mm -hmm. And at the same time in the periphery, see. you're seeing the ends of the spoon. And that, you have different sensitivities to motion speeds in the center versus the periphery of your vision. So you sense them at different rates, and it looks like they're moving at different rates. So Very that's cool. probably how that works. But... Having said that, i got to be careful because we don't really know. <laughs> well, I still appreciate you uh, taking the time to explain that. I thought it was really fascinating that it's really just something that we're – it's the way we're built, that it, people take advantage of something that's just in our brain. I guess that's the basis for all magic, really. But um, And for the other kind of spoon bending, if anyone's interested, James Randi has a lot of videos online where you can find out about the other kind of that's spoon bending. That's a different bending. kind of spoon bending. That's a magic trick. That is very cool. It is very cool. And he does great stuff explaining it. So, um, Danny, did you have yeah. any? Yeah, I guess, I mean, the next thing I want, kind of want to get to is, like, I mean, still in the same line of, of illusions, but so what have we, you know, learned about the visual system? Anything, any new aspects of the visual system that we kind of parsed by looking at illusions? Oh, sure, absolutely. So, I mean, my main line of research that I was trained to do is basically using illusions to try and understand what's going on in the visual system. So the general way, for example, that um, that people study illusions is they, they see some illusion that, that where the physical reality doesn't match perception, and they're like, huh, how does that work? So then they go and they look in the visual system to find out. Well, my general approach was a little different. So my approach was to say, um, you know, what is it about, uh, what is it about this illusion that, that we can use to discover principles about the brain. And then if we discover a principle about the brain, can we predict a new illusion based on that principle? That should happen once we know that principle. So um, uh, in my talk earlier today that I gave here at the Max Planck, uh, David Fitzpatrick, who, who is the, the head of the Max Planck, uh, introduced me and he mentioned a type of illusion that I studied uh, early in my career called backward masking. And in this illusion, you present a stimulus and then you present a second stimulus, and the first stimulus disappears because of the second stimulus. But that first stimulus entered your brain and uh, well before the second stimulus ever turned on. So how is it that the second stimulus enters your brain later and catches up to the first stimulus and erases it from consciousness before you can perceive it was the mystery. And so we went in and we put a long story short, we discovered how that happened but if that was the case, we realized we could predict a brand new kind of illusion where we could make something that's flickering permanently invisible. 
in a very yeah. powerful way. And so based on our principles that we had discovered about the brain, we could now say, okay, we can predict this new illusion that should happen that no one's ever seen before. And if it's true, then we verified what we've actually learned. And in fact, it happened. So we, we, we predicted an illusion I call the standing wave of invisibility where something's flickering and yet it becomes completely invisible. Whereas if you turn off the masking stimuli, it's quite visible. It's very uh, highly salient stimulus. And so despite the fact that it's repeating forever you and you know it's there, uh, you can't see it because of the, the, of the work of, of these masks because they're just the right timing and the right position to cause this type of uh, inhibition that we learned about. So is that, do you think that's a feature or a bug in the <laughs> uh, human visual anatomy? I think it's a, it's, it's a epiphenomenon of a feature. So for example, you might think, well, why would you want something flickering that disappears and you can't see it? And the answer is you don't. But you never you never encounter that in, in nature, so who cares, mm-hmm. right? That's the thing. Is like that illusion exists. That illusion never existed before. No one ever saw that before until I predicted it and, and and developed it in the laboratory as a testing means. So no harm, no foul. No one ever lost, uh, uh, you know, reduced their survival because of it. No one ever failed to have a baby because of it. So it just never affected our evolution. Period. So now the question is, well, what's that mechanism for, right? Why do we have that mechanism? Well, the answer is, first off, maybe we have it because it doesn't matter for survival. That's one possibility. And this is true for everything that affects evolution, Mm -hmm. right? So maybe we just don't have it because it doesn't matter. That's one possibility. But in this case, I think it does matter. And the answer is this. So imagine I took my arm and I swept it across my face. So I'm I'm moving my arm left to right in a a sweeping motion uh, over my head. Okay, when I do that, okay, the photoreceptors of our eye actually persist in their reactivity to a stimulus for about 400 milliseconds, which is almost half a second. That's a long period of time in the visual system. That's a long period of time, right? So if I do this, you should see I'm wearing a lavender shirt. You should see a lavender smear across your vision for half a second, but you don't, I assume, Mm -hmm. right? You don't because your visual system is taking the information at the back edge of my arm as it moves, and it's erasing the information behind it as it smears across. So that's exactly what you would predict happen from this kind of mechanism that does masking, that it's essentially erasing the garbage on the chalkboard, right? It's erasing the old information so that you can see more clearly the new information. It's kind of like a sharpening of your senses, right? It's a sharpening of moving stimuli mechanism we believe that that's what it's for now does it have other roles as, as well probably i don't know but that there's not there's nothing that says that these mechanisms only do one and one thing only it's very possible that these things play multiple different roles and in fact those multiple roles may be optimized so that none of them are quite perfect but because this mechanism plays a role in multiple things that you have on average you want it to have these certain parameters and, and mechanisms, even though it's not optimal for any of them because it's in general optimal for vision as a whole. So that's the kind of thing that I study, right? That's exactly what I'm interested in determining. Uh, all of these questions are key visual neuroscience questions and visual illusions in a sense are the only way to answer certain questions in vision because virtually everything we see truly is, is partially illus- illusory. I think it would be a challenge for anybody to show me a stimulus that is truly veridical, which means that's truly accurate in the world and the way we see it. I think the biggest question in science, in visual science, isn't what's illusory. The bigger question is what's not illusory in our vision. And uh, I think that's a much bigger challenge. And I think it would have to be that way. I mean, think about it. Your brain is a bunch of, it's a, it's a bunch of, lipids and salt water and proteins and uh, it's interpreting electrochemical signals coming in from you know a really really poorly designed camera like <laughs> device at the front of your face right and so you know and you think that every most of the things you see are accurate and that there's only a few things that are errors that we call illusions that's really crazy right it must be true that it's almost all garbage it's also interesting in, in that case of where uh, 
other animals have different sensitivities to different wavelengths of light. The, 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 the different colors we're able to see, we, uh, humans are only able to see the, the visible spectrum, right? You know, the Roy G. Biv, but where, you know, the, the crazy mantid shrimp or the mantis shrimp, can, they say it has up to like different, 12 different photoreceptors. Something that, like that, yeah. Um, and they can see up to ultraviolet. ultraviolet light and that kind of stuff. And it kind of adds this different, um, I guess, perspective of what does a mantid shrimp see versus what do we see and how much are we missing that that they can experience? Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's true. I think that humans might be the best visual animals in the world. They they very well might be, and I I think it's probably true. And I think it might be why we're so successful. Maybe um, you think about it. The 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 color we're most sensitive to is the the color of those weird green fire trucks you see at the airport. That mm. that 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 color is is lime green. Is what that color is called, and if you ask a firefighter why the truck is green and not red, they'll tell you because it's not ripe yet. But the fact of the matter <laughs> is that it's the color that's easiest to see in the day and the night when you have very low light levels and only certain types of photoreceptors in your eye that are specialized for night vision, called rods, can also see. So they chose that color very specifically so that it would be the most uh, most likely to cause a mirror-like reaction that allow you to see it at night or during the day. All right. So, so, but the the color we're most sensitive to is actually the peak color of the sun, right? The sun is the is the light source where our visual system was developed, mm-hmm. right? Not starlight, not moonlight. Even moonlight is sunlight, by mm-hmm. the way. But because <laughs> everything's uh, a mirror, everything's mm-hmm. a mirror. All of the light comes from the sun. Until we invented fire, mm-hmm. right? More or less. Obviously, there are fireflies and other things that are luminant in the world, but they're not very common, and we didn't really use them, I, I suspect, in developing our visual systems. Mm-hmm. But the sun was the driver of everything. And our visual system is specifically designed to see uh, sunlight, and it's specifically designed to deal with colors that that derive from sunlight. So, for example, we have special systems for seeing blue light, which is sunlight in the shade, because all of the light we see in the shade of a tree is coming from the blue part of the sky that's scattered from the rest of the atmosphere underneath that tree. The direct sunlight's blocked by the leaves, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas when we're outside of the of the, the umbra of that tree, we're in direct sunlight, and it's, it's very highly yellow light, mm-hmm. right? So we have special mechanisms for removing yellowness and blueness from what we see in order for us to accurately see colors, right, that aren't just yellow and blue. And so humans have a very, very special visual system, and other old-world primates like apes and and African monkeys and things like that, also, and Asian monkeys, also have the same kind of old-world, high-quality high visual systems, and these tend to be the smartest animals in the planet. Right, and I suspect that has to do with the fact that we can use visual stimuli, visual information better than most animals. And to kind of flip that is that you know, so some animals might be able to detect or see a lot of, you know, contrast and and different colors, such as like humans and and apes and uh, and monkeys. However, do other animals use optical illusions to avoid us? Do other animals use optical illusions to avoid us? Like I'm not thinking sure camouflage or oh, yeah, exactly. or like uh, we, sure. we have a now uh, I get it yeah no. so camouflage or or something that's that's like you know the there is some military paint that they have very very bright stri- you know oh, striped yeah, lines so, yes yeah, so that that <laughs> yeah. blends into the horizon more right. or, but it's, yeah. it's it's well camouflage so camouflage yeah. itself like like you know the army green painted trucks and clothing mm-hmm. right that's exactly what that's for is to break up the edges of a visual object so you don't recognize it as being a human being or a truck, mm-hmm. right? That when it's parked in the jungle, it actually, you can't see it very well because uh, you don't see the, the edges of it very well. And animals absolutely have developed mechanisms to camouflage themselves from each other and from mm-hmm. us in order that they're not hunted as prey as easily. And so there's a constant uh, kind of um, war between... Uh, advancing visual systems and advancing camouflage systems in order to help certain animals hide so they're not eaten. Seems like kind of like a, a co-evolutionarily 
you know, we, we developed a better visual system and then they might develop better camouflage and it can go back and forth to where we, we might not be able to directly see an animal if we're just kind of I scavenging. Think, and, I think that's the only explanation for camouflage because yeah. that took a long time to develop oh, yeah. with with small deaths uh, along the way in mm-hmm. order to drive natural selection. Mm-hmm. So the, the only real explanation is that there's a uh, kind of a, a war of perception going on that's driving evolution. Is that kind of how uh, maybe peripheral vision could have been derived as well? Is is a vo- or being able to see movement quicker on your I guess on your periphery, so you won't be able to be you be able to survive an attack so, of. So you learn where to refocus your vision. That's why we see. Motion I think it's. On the I, I think of it the opposite way. So it's not that per- peripheral vision was developed in order for us to move our eyes. I think it's more like we never developed high quality peripheral vision because we could instead move our eyes. So let's okay. think about this, okay? So you got your arm out at arm's length, uh, you got your thumb out at arm's length, you're looking at your thumbnail. This is just one one thousand, this is just one square degree of visual angle. And, and if you look at the entire visual field, it's about 1200 square degrees. So that, what that means is that your thumbnail, if you just open your eyes and you look at your thumbnail and you think about the area of your thumbnail compared to everything else that you're see, you can see in your visual field, it's about 0.1%. It's about one one thousandth of your entire visual field, okay? Very so, small. <laughs> very small. So why is it that we have 99.9% of our visual field is visual garbage and the, only the central part is... Well, the fact of the matter is the amount of brain power it takes to process that tiny little bit of vision in high quality is massive, right? Mm-hmm. Human, The human brain... About half of it does some sort of visual processing. It, much of what I'm talking about, it does other things too, right? But it, about half of the brain touches the visual system in some way or the other. Even if it's not mostly vision, it like uses some information in some way from the visual system. So you're talking about uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you didn't have eye movements and you just had the whole visual system be high quality, instead you'd need to increase that by a thousand times. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so now you're talking about your brain, since half of the brain is vision, you're talking about the brain being 500 times bigger. And all you <laughs> gained was you can now, you now no longer have to make eye movements. Mm-hmm. Or you can have a brain that actually fits through the birth canal <laughs> and have eye movements instead with a, just a small increase in brain size to control the movement of the eyes. Right? So that's the way I think about it okay. more, that a peripheral vision is basically... A, a pretty poor way it's kind of a bad way to to run a visual system it'd be much better if we could just see everything in high quality right mm-hmm. but that kept our heads small enough for us to not to be able to fit through the birth canal without mm-hmm. major changes to uh to human hip size and things yeah. like that as a mom thanks <laughs> <laughs> um, well we didn't have time to to get into um the you know prosthetics for for treating blindness, but I, I did want to touch on blindness a little bit here at the end in the last few minutes. Um, you know, we had, we devote so much brain power to processing vision. Um, do you know, just out of curiosity, if people who have gone blind or have been born blind, do those brain regions still have activity or do, do they get kind of repurposed at all? Or, I mean, I imagine someone who has been able to see and lost it, they would still be able to imagine things and activate those regions. But does anyone know if people who are I don't think blinding? they imagine vision um, if they've never seen. Right. Um, they can imagine space because they have auditory space information mm-hmm. and they have they can sense things in space just as well as as a sighted person can. But um, so when someone goes blind, there's evidence that the visual system does activate when they imagine things visually, even though they've after they've gone blind. And there's also evidence that. Um, their visual system is activated when they think about certain aspects of space and sound. However, that may not be that the visual system is now repurposed. It may not be plasticity. So that, that's how it's generally interpreted in the field, but I actually take exception to that. I think we, we have feedback mechanisms related to attention and that those the, the attentional mechanisms are spatial, which you can pay attention to a specific part of space. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine imagine that... Uh, you now were blind, but you were listening to something on your left, and you wanted to pay attention to that. It's very possible that the same attentional mechanism that allowing you to listen to a specific part of space in your auditory cortex 
is also activating the same feedback mechanisms to the visual cortex to the same point in space. And if you looked at that in, a, say, a brain scanner and you looked at where in space are you, is your visual cortex lit up, you might see activation in that part of the visual cortex. And you might, I think, uh, assume that therefore you're doing visual processing for that when it's just not true, right. that you basically are just, it's an epiphenomenon of your attentional system connected to that point in space in the visual field, and it may not be doing anything. And that's my personal, uh, I think that's probably what's happening, because the evidence suggests that they're not having a visual experience at the time. And if that's the case, then I find it hard to buy that they're actually having a, um, uh, that they've repurposed their brain so quickly, and they've right. now... Uh, are in fact able to do other things with their audition that they couldn't do earlier and now they have all this other extra power for these other senses and stuff. I think that there's some evidence that you actually do get better at your other senses when you go blind, but that might just be from use. Right. That might just be like exercise, right? Mm -hmm. You get stronger, your muscles get stronger when you exercise and those parts of the brain might get stronger when you when you uh, don't have vision to rely on and you use them more and you think about them more and you pay attention to them more and you have more you're trying to use them more, all of those things might strengthen those areas without actually invoking visual circuits in the primary visual cortex, for example, right. to, to, to bolster them or to help along. I find that a bit far-fetched, personally. Yeah, thank you. I, I was just curious what your thoughts were on that. <laughs> well, I think we're yeah. running out of time, time here, yeah. but just like I want to thank you so much for coming in and talking with us and you know, teaching us a few things about the auditory system, or not auditory system, the visual system. We've been here for a while. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Macknick has two books, The Champions of Illusion and The Slight of Mind. And go pick those up. Yeah, and, and um, we'll, we'll post some, some illusions on our social media so you can see some of the things we were talking about and, and some things that Dr. Macknick talks about in his work. And thank you so much again for taking the time thank to Thank you speak for with having us. me. This was fun. Well, that's all the time we have today. Follow us on Instagram at Ascend.Program, at Facebook at Ascend Program, and on Twitter at Program.Ascend. You can also find us on TikTok at Ascend Program. If you have questions, email us at AscendNeuro at gmail.com. I'm Danny Nemeth. I'm Lorena Areal. Signing off till next time. Directed and produced by Dr. Lorena Areal and Danny Nemeth. Music is by Max Pentosh. All of this is made possible by the generosity of the Style Nicholson Foundation in coordination with Florida Atlantic University, the Max Planck Florida Institute, and the Scripps Research Institute of Florida.